several German armored cars drove past the field. And even though the soldiers were under guard, a man named Georg Flepps, an Eastern European, was a Balkan German who had joined the SS, stood up and began firing at the Americans. What happened after that was mostly confusion. The Americans quite naturally either threw themselves down or some of them began to run. At which point the guards who had been guarding them opened fire on them. Something in the, uh, in the order of a hundred Americans were killed in that field. After the war, Jochen Piper, who was the commanding officer of that group of half-tracks that came through Bognes, was put on trial. He was sent to prison, but he was acquitted of the massacre because he had not actually been present when it took place and had not issued the orders for massacre. This is perhaps hair-splitting. Nevertheless, Jochen Piper survived until 1977 when he was killed uh, when French communists set fire to his house. He had been writing a book of his time in the war. He ran out of the house, which was blazing, realized he had left the manuscript behind, ran back to get it, and the roof caved in on top of him. Much more difficult to speak about were those members of the SS who were not only acquitted, but sheltered. You may, the know, you may know the name of um, Klaus Barbie, um, yeah. the former SS commander of Lyon in southern France, who was known as the Butcher of Lyon, who was kept safe uh, by American and British intelligence services. The question is why? In conversations with my students, this is the one thing that I have the most difficulty explaining to them. Um, why? Would you protect your former enemy, especially when your former enemy was as culpable as a man like Klaus Barbie? The cold truth, perhaps, is who better to fight the upcoming war against communism than the men who had been doing it for years? The truth of why Barbie was protected may never be entirely known. Ostracized and outlawed, the SS formed its own veterans organization known as HIAG, which stands for Wait for it. The Hilfsgemeinschaft auf Gegenseitigkeit der Angehörigen der ehemaligen Waffen SS. It was disbanded in 1992 largely because so few of its members were left alive. Its motto was taken from a once popular song in the SS. And the song is titled Wenn alle Brüder schweigen, which means when all brothers fall silent. The day when all brothers fall silent is fast approaching, but their legacy is unlikely to fade any time soon. What lessons do the deeds of the SS have to teach the modern world? That I would suggest is no longer up to them, rather it is up to us. I said when I started that I couldn't quite get this thing out of my head. This man who had shown such kindness to me, overlaid with what I had been taught to be one of the great villains of the 20th century. I could not get those two faces to overlap. Eventually, I knew that some sort of exorcism was required. So I began to write about it. Instead of going away from it, I actually went further into it. And I researched as much as I could, and eventually I wrote a book about it. Um, actually from the point of view of someone uh, who found himself in the same position as the father who I'd spoken about. After the book came out, I was asked by a British newspaper to go back to the Ardennes and write about what it was like to return to the source of where the book had been written. At first, I cavalierly said yes, and then I began to realize that perhaps that was a mistake. I had thought that with the writing of the book, perhaps I might finally be done with this chapter of my life. But I went anyway. I went in June, and I walked deep into the Ardennes forest, near a place near Krinkelt Rosherath, and I got to see much more of it than I had originally. I'm afraid what's going to come out of this box may be a bit of an anticlimax, but it's a pair of old boots. There are some other things too, but there's a story about these boots. By now I knew what had happened in some detail in these woods. I came to a stream, which is obviously still there, it's called the Jansbach. You have to walk about two miles out of the town 
and then the road disappears and it turns into mud and then you find yourself with this little muddy stream. On the night of the 16th of December, 1944, after a heavy artillery barrage, uh, a Volksgrenadier division began an attack on the lines of the American 2nd Division. Volksgrenadier were people a little bit long in the tooth, about my age I suppose, um, who had been drummed into service from the Navy, from the Air Force, who neither who really didn't exist anymore, um, and thrown into battle, battles as infantrymen. Five times they tried to cross the Jansbach Creek, but they were held back by the machine guns of the American 2nd Infantry Division. When the Volksgrenadier failed, the SS were brought in. And they launched one huge assault through the forest. And the reason they were able to cross the stream is because it was so choked with the bodies of the Volksgrenadier that they were literally able to jump across. They rushed the American positions and were able to reduce the foxholes one after the other. And I came to this place in the forest. And all along this ridge, Here's the stream, and there's a ridge with foxholes dotting it. And all along the ridge, I found boots. But these are German boots. You can still see the marks of where the hobnails were. And I thought, why on earth are German boots lying on the ground when I know the Germans won this particular engagement? And I picked up a pair, and I thought, well, maybe this will come clear to me someday. And I picked up a few other things. A piece of an American soldier's canteen bottle. You're welcome to come and see these. Um, a piece of uh, a mortar round, um, a great big chunk of shell, and other things. Um, in the bottoms of the foxholes, wrapped very tightly, um, I found pieces of the um, SS camouflage capes. This is a piece from the very center of it. Everything on the outside had been rotted, but I was able to pull this out of the middle. I took these things home, and after I got back to America, it was in the middle of the summer, it's one of those baking hot New Jersey days, um, and I was lying there, and all of a sudden, I was dripping with sweat, and all of a sudden, I realized why those boots had been dumped on the side of that hill. It's because when they crossed the stream, the Germans got their boots wet, and it was December, and it was freezing, and their boots were not high quality, and they took the boots from the Americans and left their own behind. I think what they left behind is as close to being a place that is haunted as any I've ever been in. And I continue to be haunted by it. I gave a talk about what it was like to write this um, in New York City a few years ago. And at the end of it, a very elderly gentleman came up to me, clearly German, and said, you made a mistake. And I didn't doubt that. I think I'd made several mistakes. And I said, I apologize in advance. Will you tell me what it is? And he said, the dog tags of the SS do not have names on them, only numbers. I didn't realize that. And I said, I'll, if I ever get back to this topic again, sir, I will make that change. And at the very end, when I was getting ready to go, the lady who'd been running the event said, somebody left something for you. And what had been left for me was a dog tag of an SS grenadier. Um, I'll hand that around so you can see what it looks like. Um, in a way, this story is difficult to end. But perhaps the best way to end it is with the way I end up talking about it now. How can you revisit these things time after time without them literally doing damage to you? Um, in the classes I teach, I work with students, mostly high school seniors, who are on the cusp of childhood and adulthood. They are in that mercurial time which all of us know, but all of us know only when it's over, when everything seems possible. And to be reminded of that uh, on a daily basis is both humbling and makes it worth going back into the catacombs of, uh, of the darkest chapters of human history. Um, I think I've run myself out of time. Thank you very much, sir. I hope that was all right. Thank you. Thank you.